Excellent. Uh, okay, so final talk is uh, Connell. Uh, I can see his title there. Integrated Understanding of the Early Jurassic Earth System and Time Scale. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and it's very nice to actually see people. Could I share the screen? Oh. Okay, so it's very, it's very nice to see people in person again. Um, and of course, the reason it's TDC is uh, before Christmas, uh, I think I told Richard I was happy to give a talk, but that he should prioritise younger people. And um, <clears throat> and then on Friday morning, as I was about to get on a ferry from Ireland back to the UK in a forsake gale, he, he messaged and said there might be a slot. Um, and by the time we landed, Andy had already bagged that slot. Um, and so I said I was quite happy to sit in the audience and stroke my whiskers for the, but anyway. So, um, so TBC almost meant the boat crashed, but uh, that's a <laughs> different discussion. Okay, so, um, so I was kind of thinking what I could do at the end of the day, um, because I know of these meetings were all a bit tired at the end of the day. So there's going to be a bit of science, and there's also going to be a little bit of, um, it's probably for the younger people, it, it's to give you a perspective that sometimes things don't happen quite as quickly as you would like them to. Um, and so the beginnings of this is actually a chat I had with somebody who's 12 years ago now, 2011, um, who's a Jurassic stratigrapher, and he was getting very excited about trying to figure out what was going on in the early Jurassic. Um, and so one of the, th the reasons people were very interested in the early Jurassic was, uh, as we'll see, it's really the birth of the modern ocean system. It's really the birth of the Earth as we would currently understand it, as we would currently view it. Um, because we'll see we have the breakup of this supercontinent of Pangaea. We're going to start to establish oceanic seaways between the various continents, and it's kind of an Earth that's more similar to what we have today. Um, so as part of this, he asked if I was interested in contributing. We ended up with a, with a small army of people, 48 scientists in the end. Um, and we had a workshop in 2013. Um, and in 2013, then we decided we would put together this consortium and try and un have a look at the early Jurassic. And this was the justification for it. As I said, it's essentially the birth of a modern continental configuration. Once we start to break up all these different bits and pieces, generate seaways, etc., um, it's really it's where we have the oldest record of oceanic crust. The oldest um, oceanic crust that we have is in the early Jurassic. Um, it's where we have the origin and expansion of modern biota. However, it's also characterized by a bunch of non-uniformitarianism, non-uniformitarian events in Earth history, and in particular, we'll see. I'm going to focus on possible effects of large igneous provinces and episodic intense oceanic anoxia. So, um, and that, those sort of non-uniformitarian events have really sort of driven a lot of thinking, geological thinking over probably the last 40 or so years. So you will probably all have heard in, in about 1980, um, Alvarez and Alvarez published a paper in Science arguing that there was a massive um, there was a mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, and they tied that into meteorite impact in the Gulf of Mexico, Chicxulub. Um, and that suddenly set people off uh, looking for possible causes and correlations of other things that might have happened in Earth history. Uh, and this is a diagram I've always liked from Vincent Coutillo and Paul Rennie in 2003. Uh, the reason I like it is because most XY diagrams you will see plot a variable on here and then something that varies with it on here but they've managed to plot time against time and unsurprisingly they've managed to get a straight line that runs all the way up through the middle of it. so well um, but but uh, and you know th 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 there's a sort of a, i'm making a bit of a joke and there's an obvious reason for that you know you wouldn't try and tie in uh, let's say an end Cretaceous mass extinction to something that happened in the end of the Permian, because then you'd be sitting over here and your point would plot a long way from your straight line. The other thing that's of interest here is that it plots a whole number of different things. It's a bit of a sort of a mishmash of things on the y axis mass extinctions, oceanic anoxic events, 
and geological time scale boundaries. So you really are plotting time against time here, which is. But on a more serious point, the reason these geological time scale boundaries come in is because, of course, historically, when we were uh, putting together the geological time scale, it was based on the turnover of fauna. It was, it was based on extinctions. Um, and so the early Jurassic, we'll see there's, it starts with a big uh, mass extinction here, the end Triassic, which people have tried to tie into the emplacement of the Central Atlantic magmatic province. There's a major oceanic anoxic event here in the Tuartian, um, which people have tried to tie in with the Karoo and Ferrar. And there are older events in here, um, a, a older oceanic anoxic events within the Plains vacuum. And this is really a bit of the, the time frame that we're going to focus on. So, as I said, you always have to be careful that when you are plotting things, you are indeed comparing apples with apples and uh, not other fruit. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, so I've already mentioned there's a possible link to between some of these major events in the early Mesozoic and the emplacement of large igneous provinces. Um, and as we can see, if you go take a step back, there are a lot of large igneous provinces. Uh, particularly out in the oceans, and of course that's because we actually have the oceanic record going back to the early Jurassic. But there are a number of puzzles in here, and in particular the one I'm going to focus on is the one that's going to tie in with our study at the end of the, uh, the Tuartian here. Um, and that's that we, in a number of places, we have multiple, um, multiple uh, large igneous provinces being in place. Now, some we think we can tie together. Parana and Nettendecker were probably together before the South Atlantic rifted. And for those who are curious, that's this one here. There's the Nettendecker. Parana is on the other side here, on the Brazilian side. So if you close up the South Atlantic, it, that was probably contiguous. Uh, but, but another one, the one that's implicated in the early Jurassic events, is the Karoo Ferrar. And the Karoo is here, and the Ferrar is all the way down here. And even if you close up the Southern Ocean, what you'll find is they're actually still geographically disparate and they're geochemically not identical. So there's an interesting story that I'll come to there. Okay, um, and so this is a slightly more rational way of trying to look at things. This is looking at extinction events and possible um, large igneous provinces. Okay, so I'm going to jump now. It's the only time I've ever given a talk where there's a, a, a quote from farmer and stock breeder, okay, from uh, December 1968. Uh, so when we were discussing getting this project off the ground, we were casting around to see, um, you know, were there any really good places where we could really start to go and look at the early Jurassic? Uh, and there are a number of obvious exposures scattered around the UK. Uh, but it turns out the BGS in their wisdom um, had drilled a hole and this is the actual original drill site here on the Lynn, very close to the Lynn Peninsula in Wales. So here's the Lynn Peninsula. Here's Wales. The Lynn Peninsula is that bit that's sticking out. This is where I nearly crashed last week. Um, you come around and they drill a borehole here. And actually, the, what they were originally expecting to find was they would drill through some quaternary here, and then they were expecting to hit Paleozoic rocks. Um, and it took them three to four years to drill those borehole in stages. So they drilled through the quaternary. And then to their surprise, they discovered some tertiary rocks and they kept drilling. And so they needed more money. This will be a recurring theme in my talk. Um, and then they kept drilling. And then, then they went into the Jurassic and they kept drilling and they kept drilling. Um, and as you can see, they went down um, they went down about 900 meters or so, and they just crossed into the Perma Triassic. They never hit the Paleozoic, so this was a big surprise to them. So we were casting around and we were looking at boreholes, and these are essentially Europe, UK and European, European cores and outcrops. And we looked around and we basically found the Mokros was bonanza time. If you want a high resolution record, of what the hell was going on in the early Jurassic, this was the place to go. It covers the sort of um, Tuartian, Peensbachian, Sinemurian, Hatangian, and you can see it's miles thicker than anything else. So we said, great, let's go and have a look at what it looks like. Uh, and then you go to the BGS. And 
they have a big building out the back in Keyworth that looks a little bit like one of the end scenes from Indiana Jones. It's like racks and racks and boxes and boxes. Um, and this is what we pull out. Um, the lower half of the core, so this was really the sort of bit that essentially goes through the very earliest Jurassic, was in, was in pretty poor condition. Um, it had been smashed into lots of pieces. People have been scavenging ammonites like crazy, heavy sampling, oxidation. But we did find there are pieces here that are much more intact. Um, and so we decided, well, this was a good place to start. So, um, so we went, we took some samples here in 2011 and we actually found they had a relatively stable magnetic signal. So we thought actually there might be the basis of, of doing a mag magnetostratigraphy here that would help to start to tie different records together. And they were gonna measure a whole bunch of other things on this core. And you'll see some of those results in a minute. Now, limited measurements have been carried out when the, <clears throat> when the core was originally drilled, but the magnetization was generally too weak for the instruments of the day. Um, so as I said, in 2011, we, we, we realized there was a stable remnant magnetization. So we went back and resampled as much as we could. Um, so I'm going to focus first on this part here. So it's the Tuartian period of the early Jur Jurassic, um, and it's associated with an oceanic anoxic event. And so what happens here is we get um, a major episode, episode of organic carbon burial in the sedimentary record. And because we're burying lots of organic carbon, we end up with very, very negative carbon isotope values. So, as I said, we went, we sampled it initially at two to five meter resolution, spanning this entire Tuartian stage. Um, and uh, we took it back and we started demagnetizing it. Um, and this is all published work. Um, and so, essentially, so these are probably the only documents I'm going to show, well, and the next, the next one. Um, so, what we found was that a small fraction of it gave us very clean demagnetization. So, they all had some sort of an overprint. The overprints were randomly oriented. We suspect they were acquired sitting in the core shed in BGS. Um, and then there's, an, there's a higher coercivity component that you can demagnetize. Um, and in some samples, it's pointing down. Um, this is another one that's pointing down. Um, and then here are some that where it was actually pointing up. And then there were some other samples that really you would get them up to about 60 uh, or so millitesla, and then you couldn't demagnetize them anymore and you just got garbage or they were so weak that we couldn't do anything with them. So we basically, we classified these as A, ones where you could really fit nice linear components to them and then B, where they sort of buzzed around a polarity but you couldn't actually fit a line to them. Um, and so this, this is what they all look like and when you first see that, you think, oh, that's a disaster. It looks like somebody's taken a shotgun to a stereo net. Um, but it's not quite as disastrous as you think, because of course the core was unoriented. And so we have no declination control on any of this. And so if you peer through this data with the eye of faith, you will see certainly the upper ones all seem to cluster around a particular inclination. And so if you actually go and look at the inclinations on their own, what we find is that uh, the ones of normal polarity give a mean inclination of plus 37, and the reverse polarity also give a mean inclination of minus 37. So that was the first clue that actually there was something sensible, uh, something coherent in here, because uh, <coughs> in fact, it's surprisingly good. It always makes you worry when it falls out that good. <coughs> um, anyway, both polarities combined give, a, give a, a nice overall mean. Okay, so it looks like there might be reversals present in here, and that looks like they might be antipodal if you look at the inclinations. Now, there's a bit of a, bit of a problem. And the, the problem is that the mean inclination gives, is too shallow for what we would expect for the Jurassic. It, give, it would give it a paleo latitude of about 21 degrees. And we know at the time that Britain was sort of north of 30 and possibly even as far north as 40, depending on whose reference data set you have. So that sounds like bad news, but it's good news. We know it can't be a remagnetization because Britain has never been that far south since the early Jurassic. Britain's been moving north ever since. 
So if it were a remagnetization, we would expect it to be remagnetized in a steeper direction. So what we then did was we went back and we looked, actually looked at the, the rocks themselves, and of course, the nice fine-grained mudstones, the prone to inclination shallowing. And so the idea we had was this is probably being flattened. And so what we did was we went and had a look at, um, we couldn't do this distribution analysis that Tox and Kent suggest, where you essentially try and back calculate the flattening function because we didn't have the full vector. We only had the inclinations. But what we did was we looked in the literature and these flattening factors typically come out at values of about 0 0.6. And so if you, if you go and uh, take the apparent latitude of about 30 and use a, a flattening factor of about 0.6, oops, I don't know if the pointer is showing here, a flattening factor of about 0.6, that takes you up to about 40 degrees, and that's about what we would expect in terms of the latitude. And if you go for an extreme flattening, um, that would actually pull you right up, more, up closer to 40 degrees. Okay, so we end up with the magnetostratigraphy, we can assign polarities, and we then went and, in fact, we did, we did this before the magnetostrap, we'd measure the carbon isotope stratigraphy. So we knew where this event was, and we were now starting to home in on a useful magnetostrap for it. So we can now start to tie it to other records elsewhere in the world. Um, and so these are the, 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 the ones here are the, only the class A, where you can identify the polarity and inclination. Uh, but they were supported by class B ones, which are down here. And then there was a bunch that we didn't get anything sensible from. Okay, I won't bore you too much by waiting, walking you through this. There are lots of correlations you can do. Um, but the important correlation was that with there is a, some published data that tie in with the um, Karoo volcanic rocks in Southern Africa. And what we were able to show was that this magnetostrat is consistent with, you can correlate it into what was going on in the Karoo at the time. So in the Karoo, we have the emplacement of a large igneous province. And so the idea is that the emplacement of a large igneous <coughs> province effectively caused a major change in the environmental conditions at the time. Vast emissions of sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. We have a sort of a volcanic winter. We have the shutdown of primary productivity, shutdown of photosynthesis, and export of organic carbon, burial of organic carbon in marine settings. Okay, so, so that, was, that was the story starting, starting to, to come together. Um, and in the meantime, um, there's been a whole army of other people who are looking at other proxies for environmental conditions. Um, and so this is taking us through to, I guess, somewhere around 2016, where we managed to get an ICDP grant and a NERC large grant. And the idea was we were going to drill a new sister core to Mokros, where we would get the bottom half of the hole, the bit that was all broken and crappy. Um, now, for various reasons, that ended up getting incredibly complicated. Drilling permits, we had to survey for newts, um, all sorts of other things. So effectively, even though we had the money, not quite all the money we needed, um, the drilling kept being pushed back. We couldn't start our second hole. So we kept analyzing the hell out of the old hole. So, so that's where the Mokras hole was. These are the Karoo lavas. Uh, and here are, the Etten, or here are the Farrar volcanics. And you can see they're actually separated by quite a long distance here. Um, they're about six to 7,000 miles apart. And that's always been one of the mysteries about the Karoo Farrar province. Why, you know, they're, in terms of age, they're the same, but why, how are they, how and why are they related? Why were they in place at the same time? So we have been, as I said, we've been looking at a whole lot of other proxies. So here's that magnetostrap from that magnet original Mokros core. Um, we had a duration of about 3 million years for the entire event, but here's the, here's the um, uh, carbon isotope data. This is just the smooth version of what I showed you before. Um, but what we now also started measuring was um, osmium. And so osmium, 
isotopes are essentially a, a marker for an enhanced continental weathering. Uh, we'd also started to measure um, mercury in the sediments and the primary source of mercury in, in sedimentary sequences is volcanic emissions. There is mercury aerosols being emitted during volcanic eruptions. And so you can see here is that corresponding to this uh, period of uh, burial of organic carbon, we see there's a huge increase in the amount of mercury that was present. So this is actually a really good line of evidence that ties the um, oceanic anoxic event into increased volcanism. And that increased volcanism in turn is probably linked to the emplacement of the Karoo and the Ferrar. So, um, so that seems great, but we still have this sort of oddity. Why are these two things so far apart? So the answer to that came when we actually started to look at um, what was actually going on in terms of plate rates and plate motions at the time. So you, you remember we said that, um, that the, these two were in place at the same time, but were chemically and geochemically very different. And we reckoned that the duration of the event was about three or so million years. So what we did was we actually went and looked at what was going on in terms of plate motions. And effectively, the key thing you'll see here is that um, there's a slowdown in the plate rate. So you can just about see changes in latitudinal velocity here, which is this uh, green thing. The velocity slows right down just at the point at which this thing is in place. Um, and you can do the same thing using the hotspot for the Ferrar one, and you can see again that there's a slowdown. In fact, there's a change in the plate motion at the time. And so our idea is actually a very, very simple one. The idea is that these plates are constantly moving around over the mantle. And they're constantly bumping into plumes coming up from the underside, but it's only very occasionally, and particularly if the thing slows down enough to give the plume enough time to burn through the whole of the crust that they actually get in place and they actually get to produce these major um, environmental changes. And of course, at this time for Africa, it, it does correspond with a, with a change in the, in the plate rate. So um, does that hold for others? We've, we've gone and done the same thing. We've had a brief look at what was going on for the end Permian mass extinction. And again, it seems to relate to a slowdown and a change in the plate vectors. We see a slowdown um, for the North Atlantic associated with the onset of North Atlantic volcanism. Uh, and we think there's a kink here and a slowdown associated with the East African rift volcanism. So, summary number one. <laughs> <Born of heaven. laughs> Nearly there. Um, essentially, we were forced to work on this old core because we were still working our way through all the permitting and stuff for the new core. Um, and so actually, ironically, we managed to extract a huge amount, a huge amount of information from it. Um, we finally uh, ended up having to give up on the idea of re-drilling at the Mokros site. Um, and that was in 2019, we finally had to pull the plug on it. So that was uh, seven, so eight years after the original idea, three years, oh, sorry, I have to get my, I have to get my years right. Six years after starting to put together a consortium to look at it. And three years after it was funded, we, we realized we couldn't drill that hole. So we ended up going somewhere else, which is down here. It's in Shropshire, near the market town of Market Drayton. I had a very happy Christmas there in 2020. Um, the Priest 2 drill site that had been drilled in 1972 as part of an exploration well. And um, this was it two years ago. So it was this, the rig we had in. Um, quite a big, big affair. I got the joy of working the night shifts. Um, these are just some pictures of, of a new core. Um, but for the last two years, we've been systematically working our way through this, scanning the absolute hell out of it. Um, so we've done a whole lot of, of borehole scans and core scans in the BGS labs. Uh, we started the magnetostratigraphy um, and we had incredibly high recovery for this. 
And in particular, this one actually gives us the bottom half. So it gives us all the way down through the clean Spachian and down through the Triassic Jurassic boundary. So um, future prospects <laughs> for, for understanding what's going on in the Mesozoic are bright. And I think our immediate prospects are, are also quite bright. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? No. See? Okay. So we so we started this 12, 12 years ago. We finally managed to drill the hole two years ago. And so it's really just to give you some sort of a flavor that sometimes these big kind of projects are a long time in gestation and take a long time to Brilliant. Thank you very much, Connell. Yes. Um, Connell was my PhD supervisor. And I remember oh, some sage <laughs> advice. Take how long you think it is, double it and add six months. <laughs> Does that rule still apply? I'd say take how long you think it is, double it and then add six years and then, then you might be close. Okay, so on that note.